All right, we are still in Matthew 18. It has been a fairly long road through this chapter, but this chapter is fairly juicy. It has lots of interesting information, and today could be a fairly lively conversation. I don't know that we will actually finish the chapter, given the time that it is now, but um, we'll see. We'll see. Uh, and if we do finish the chapter, we probably won't have engaged in as much conversation as we wanted. So it's a, it's a catch-22 there. We either get to have the conversation we want and slow down, or we just speed through the chapter and, and move on. We have made it uh, through verse, oh, I'm going to say 11. Remember, your versions may not have verse 11 in it because it's missing. A lot of the old manuscripts don't have verse 11 in it. Some other manuscripts have what they call a borrowed verse from Luke 19, and, and so they've placed it in here. Whether or not Jesus actually said those words or not, the context fits. Those words were that Jesus came to seek and to save, or to save that which is lost. Uh, and, and we are at a point in this chapter where we're talking about the wanderer, the one who does wander away from uh, righteousness, or wander away from the flock of God. Uh, this whole chapter can be broken down in a, in a lot of ways, but I break it down in fellowship. The first section talks about fellowship. We're getting into a fellowship section. And then, at the, toward the end, and then actually a little bit of what we do today, well, actually all of what we do today, is, is about forgiveness. So, fellowship, which is your responsibility as a, a disciple, Fellowship, which is our responsibility as a group of disciples, and then forgiveness, which it plays on all of those. It plays on both of those, brings them together, and it also brings in, it overlays uh, Jesus' role, or God's role, in our lives and in, in the forgiveness of our sins. So, we are at a point where we are talking about wandering sheep. The, uh, the point we're at, Jesus has already mentioned being disciples in the vein of, of children, in the likeness of children, and emptying ourselves, emptying our, our preconceived notions, emptying us of any um, uh, aspirations of greatness, and becoming like children in order to grow in new ways in the leadership of Jesus, in the, in the fellowship of, of Christ. And then as we grow in those new ways, we're going to encounter temptations. We're going to encounter stumbling blocks. We talked about that in the, in the prior weeks. We're going to encounter things that at least attempt to move us away from that fellowship of, of Jesus. And starting in verse, I'm going to say 11, but we're actually going to start in verse 12 uh, because 11 is missing. We talked about that last week. So we're going to start in verse 12, and Jesus lays down for us a little story. And the story is emblematic of how serious Jesus is about chasing after us, making sure that we are a part of his flock. And if we've wandered away, how he pursues us to bring us back into his flock. Okay, so let me, let me start there. We're going to read verse 12, and we're going to read through verse 14. What do you think, Jesus says, if a man owns a hundred sheep, and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the ninety-nine on the hills and go to look for the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, truly, I tell you, he is happier about that one sheep than about the ninety-nine that did not wander off. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. It's a nice little, uh, it's actually quite brief, and it uh, tells a significant story in a very limited number of passages. But I mentioned last week that I wanted to dissect this just a little bit, not really dissect it, but I wanted to talk around it a little bit because of a book that Cindy loaned me that was really good. Um, this book is by uh, Philip Keller, W. Philip Keller, and he was at one time in his life a shepherd. And so he talks about characteristics of sheep and the nuances of their behaviors. And a couple of things that he talks about is this, one of the things is this idea of a cast sheep. Now, you've heard the expression downcast, okay? Um, a cast sheep is one they call cast because they're distraught. They are in a downcast disposition. But there's a reason they're downcast, and that's usually because they've fallen over, 
in some form or fashion. Okay? There's a couple of ways that this casting can happen. Um, let's see. Where do I want to go? I'm actually trying something different today. My notes are on an iPad, and, and I do have my backups, but we're, we're going to try something a little different today. So this is going to be a new experience. We'll see if I can, I can do this. One of the ways, and it's, it's probably not the most common, but a, a sheep can get into this position when it has a misstep. Maybe it, it steps in a hole or it steps in a crag or something, and it loses its footing and it rolls over. Now, if you can picture in your head this, they're, they're pretty big animals. They're not really small, like we always, you know, they're not the little uh, nursery rhyme sheep. Sheep are pretty big, and they're big around the body, and not so big on the feet, okay? The feet are kind of short. So if they happen to fall over and their feet can't touch the ground, they end up sometimes rolling on their back, and then they just end up flailing, okay? That's a cast sheep. They can't get back up. And there are things that happen to their bio biology when they're in that position. There are certain gases that go the wrong way or do the wrong thing. Um, blood flow can't occur like it needs to, and eventually they will, they will die. I mean, in, in short span of time, they will die. Um, if it's good weather, uh, good weather meaning cooler weather, if it's um, not sunny, moderate temperature, they could stay in that position for a couple of days. But if it's hot weather, especially if there's um, uh, vultures or, or various carrion around, or if there are um, enterprising cougars or you know other animals around, they may not stay there very long, right? They're gonna they're gonna die of other means. So they're desperate, and what they will do is they will kick and they will they will you know try to get back up, but they can't. There's no way to do it. So one of the ways that that happens is they have a misstep. Another way that it happens is they find a comfortable spot. Oh, they've sat down in this nice, lush area or a wallow, and they just start, ooh, that feels good. And Oh, and they roll a little bit too far, and they're like, oh, oh, no, oh, oh, no. Okay. So there's a couple of ways that a sheep can be cast. Let's think about this in our fellowship of Jesus. What happens when we take a misstep and we lose our footing? We might find ourselves in a position where we are unable to get our footing again, unable to get our feet back on the ground. And we need someone, a shepherd. Uh, I'm not meaning shepherd in the way of shepherd of the church, just a, a, a person, a shepherd, to come in and set us back upright. And what often happens for a cast sheep, you know, that circulation issue, they will have to not only set the sheep back upright, but they will have to massage the legs and get that blood flowing again. So it's not just someone who will set it right, but also someone who will tend that sheep for a while to make sure that everything's flowing right. So we could, ourselves, in our walk with God, or in his flock, take a misstep, and find ourselves in the same position. That's one of the things the shepherd really watches out for. They are constantly on the, the watch, counting their sheep, making sure everyone's there, because if one of these sheep gets in this kind of position, they are vulnerable. Vulnerable not only to their own deaths or their own... Uh, personal challenges, but they're also very accessible. They can't defend themselves. They can't even run away from uh, the cougars or the coyotes or the, you know, the, the other animals that may be searching for their next meal. Okay? So we might find ourselves in a position where the people outside the church are looking to us going, ah, there's someone I can get. I'll nab them away. And they just start picking, picking Christians off because Christians have found themselves in a position that they're vulnerable and they can't defend themselves. They're not rooted, they're not grounded in, in the fertile soils that Jesus brings us to. So that's one thing. Another way that a sheep, oh, uh, the, well, I actually did that. Where do I want to go with that? Oh, for us, for us, us Christians. I think more often than not, yes, we take missteps. Missteps are obvious, aren't they? 
generally speaking, we know when we've taken a misstep. What's less obvious is when we want to find our comfort zone. When we find that place where life is good. Oh, that feels so good. Oh, let me just relax here a minute. What happens if I roll over? Oh, oh no. Our Christian walk just got diverted because we sought the comforts. We sought to wallow where we shouldn't. And Jesus has to chase us down. He has to find us. In that case, it's not chasing us down because we're not going anywhere. We're, 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 we're just not with his flock. His flock has moved on. And he's got to say, uh oh, I've got to go find Paul because Paul's back here rolling around in the comfort, you know. Uh, I read a book one time. It said uh, there are no padded crosses. The cross that we bear doesn't look like a mattress. But we want it to. We want our Christian life to be comfortable. And it's not, or it shouldn't be. It, and, and yes, God does bring us blessings. But remember, we talked about the roses God promises also has thorns. Okay? We talked about that. Jesus says, you're going to have times of trial. Stumbling blocks will come. So we need to be very careful in our Christian walk not to get so caught up in the comforts that we forget where Jesus is taking us because his past, his table when we say table land his, his pastures are far better for us than what we think is comfortable and sometimes our own, own mind can take us that way so sometimes a sheep will get cast another characteristic of a sheep is sometimes a sheep can just be annoyingly stubborn and wander away. You know, we always get this picture of sheep is, a sheep will follow other sheep. And that's generally true, but sometimes you get a stubborn one that wants to go his own way. And if that sheep goes his own way once, sometimes he will go that way again. And again, and it becomes a habitual thing. And so he describes how one of his sheep he would constantly get himself caught in, in fences because he was trying to get away, trying to escape. And so he, the, the shepherd, uh, Philip Keller, was constantly having to go rescue this sheep because this sheep got himself in predicaments because he didn't want to be where the shepherd felt he should be. He wanted to go over there. And so he constantly had to tra track him down. Jesus is doing that for us because in our own thinking, in our own ways, we're chasing our own desires and we forget that Jesus has expectations, Jesus has promises, and if we just stick by our shepherd, he will, he will make sure we are protected in ways that we can't even fathom. But we want to chase our own dreams. And that can take us on the wrong path. And Jesus, our shepherd, remember that missing verse? That missing verse, Jesus came to save that which was lost. We should always look at ourselves as the lost. Okay? Even though we may look at someone else and say, well, we're better off than they are. We're still lost without Jesus. And that's going to play into the next little bit. Okay? When we get to the next bit, this next little section, yeah, we've done this one. Boom. Any questions on that? Okay, this next little section is often addressed or described as discipline within the church. Some of your headings in your Bibles actually have it right, and they, well, more right, and they talk about um, something about when a brother sins against you, or when, you know, restoring a brother who sins against you, and that's actually more the appropriate perspective. Now, my header, and I've already mentioned how I don't like the headers here, but my header says dealing with sin in the church. Well, that's not where Jesus is taking this. It might end up as a church decision, but that's not the focus. The focus is restoration of an individual who has done something quite egregious against you. We're not talking about the small offense. 
we're talking about something you could potentially take this person to court for. Okay? We're talking about something serious. If you're going to take it, if this is something that can go all the way to the public meeting, it needs to be something that is serious. Okay, so let's read this. Starting in verse 15, and we're going to read through verse... We're just going to read through verse 17 right now. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you've won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Now, what you often hear is... Teachers will, will lay this out as this is the pattern that you need to do when you're trying to kick someone out of the church. You know, someone needs to talk to them, and then they probably aren't going to hear. And then so two or three others need to talk to them, and then there's, they resist that. So eventually the church has to make a decision. You're gone. We're going to discipline you and disassociate with you. That's not the perspective. Remember where we just came from. Jesus wants every soul to be saved. Um, many of you can remember we had a, a situation with another individual in this church. And I know I, he, the, event, the, the situation eventually got my goat and I had a little bit of hard hard time dealing with it. But I feel like I was, I hope I was pretty patient with it. Um, but this, eventually the church had to make a decision to ask this person to leave. This is not the process by which you go to ask someone to leave. This is the process you go through to save that person, to redeem that person back into the fold. Now, we will get to a point where we talk about what happens when they refuse. Okay, and then we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. It doesn't necessarily talk, I don't think, it talks about separation from the church. Because I don't think this conversation is about church fellowship necessarily at all. Remember, the church didn't exist at this point in time. Even though we want to apply it here, we want to overlay it here. When he says, tell it to the assembly, that's the larger group. That doesn't necessarily mean the official church group. Okay, because that doesn't exist. If they understood assembly at this time, they understood the synagogue. That's the assembly that they would have understood if it was a designated group like that. Okay? So, let's find the place in my notes. And I want to start with James 5. Yes, James 5. If you want to flip over there, James has this nice little ditty at the end of James 5, of chapter 5. And I don't know about you, but when I read James, I'm just, it's, it steps all over my toes. But James 5, verse 19, it's right there at the end. And one could say that this is James's summary of the entire book. Look, people, he says, this is what this was all about. My brothers and sisters, verse 19, if one of you should wander from the truth, oh, wait a minute, that's what we've been talking about, isn't it? Okay. If one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way <gasps> will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. That's our purpose. Okay. When we talk about and we address Matthew 18, keep that in mind. That's our goal. Our goal is not to cause separation. Our goal is to bring back in and restore a person, not just to the fellowship, but to Jesus, to the fellowship of Jesus. Okay? We also, before we even go very far, we want to look at Matthew chapter 7. I want to really draw this out. 
Matthew 7, we've already talked about this. Oh, man, in, at this point, it's been years ago. <laughs> Do not judge, for you too will be judged. In the same way that you judge others, you will be judged. Now, remember, we didn't talk. We, we, when we talked about this passage, we were really talking about this attitude of judgmentalism. Okay? It's, a, it's not that you cannot make a judgment. It is a lifestyle of judgmentalism. But here he says, verse 3, when you look at the, uh, why don't you look at the speck of sawdust, or why do, you, um, blah, 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 blah. why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? Hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So before we get into Matthew 18, before we chase this whole idea that we're pointing out a sin in another brother's life, we have to address Matthew 7. Don't go pointing, or pointing fingers at other people when you yourself have issues that you need to attend to. Because it's awfully embarrassing when you go public, when this, you chase this thing all the way through and you end up having to go public with the, uh, the offense. And then in that public arena, your own sin is exposed. Oh. But this, I, I wasn't meaning that. That's not where I wanted this to go. No, it's not. But be very cautious. That's why I say the sin or the, the debt that is referred to in Matthew 18 is not petty. That particular offense is something that is egregious. It's something that says this is really important. We need to restore this person both in the eyes of God and the eyes of the fellowship. Okay, Be very careful when and how you use all of the steps here. But we're going to go through the steps. So let's go ahead and read. We have other verses here, but they're, they're later. Let's go ahead and re read this, uh, this little passage. Oh, I already did. Never mind. Uh, the first step. Yeah, I, I get ahead of myself, don't I? The first step. Go to them in private. So the first thing we should do is tell all our friends about what happened. No? Well, I was sure that if we couched it in the, because they need prayer, because, you know, I want to make sure that people pray for them, I thought that was okay. No. Because that's just putting sugar coating on the wrong attitude. You don't gossip about the offense. You go to the person, in person, and you address the offense. You say, look, I... One thing you don't do is point, to, point a finger and say, you did this and that was wrong. Maybe depending on the offense. But what you do is you say, when this occurred, I, remember our I statements, you know, I felt this or I perceived this. Am I wrong in that approach or am I wrong in that perception? I want to make sure that we're, we're really doing what's right with, for the for your spirit, your fellowship of Jesus, and the fellowship that we have, because I love you. And I care about where your life is going, and I care about where our life together is going, and I want to make sure that we together are headed where Jesus wants us to go. That's the disposition that we should have. So, so, so often we don't carry that disposition, do we? How easy is it to love someone that's hurt you? That's offended you? <laughs> yeah, if it's a son or daughter or a parent, then yeah, you have, but you have other um, experiences and other built-in, I don't know, helps to, that, that help you to overcome that offense. <sighs> yeah. But even then, I've seen families fall apart because they just lack that, that concern for each other, that love for each other. 
So go in person, one-on-one. -on -one. Why one-on-one? -on -one? It's private. You know, none of us likes to have our sins aired in the open. Does anyone not have sin? No. So we all have something. And that something we like to really lay hidden, don't we? It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a matter of courtesy, really. Because if I can help you find your way, get your footing, without sharing it with the world, then not only have I helped you find your fellowship with Jesus, but I've also strengthened our relationship. And I've saved face. In, in the Arabic world, saving face is a big, big deal. There, in the Arabic world, when you try to correct someone or when you offer someone another way of seeing things, you give them an out. You give them a way to save face even as they change their minds. You don't slam them in the face and say, you need to change or else and give them no options. It's, a, it's just a matter of grace. It's part of their culture. Yes. We might be wrong. When, and, well, you're wrong in two ways. You might be wrong in your facts, mm -hmm. and you might be wrong in your, well, you are wrong in your approach when you go that way. Yeah. But let's take it up on those facts. You might be wrong in the facts. What's the next step? If they say, you know, I just don't see it that way. I'm not sure, I'm not sure you're of the right heart or mind, and I'm not sure that, that I'm wrong. What do you do next? Well, I like that. I like that. Listen to them. Yeah. Yeah. B before you go, again, tell the world, because we're apt to gossip about this, think through what is it they said? What was their side of the story? Be open to change of your own, because it may be that they're the ones who are approaching you and you're the offender. <laughs> Whoa, wait a minute. Okay. Yeah. Let's sit together and let's, let's open the word. Let's see where this goes. But what is it when we're wrong about the facts in general? I see it my way. They see it their way. Uh, we're both witnesses, but we both witnessed something different. And that happens even for witnesses in court. Uh, I, I watched a program. It was, it was fascinating. There was a setup. They had all of these people here, and you know they were supposed to be watching one thing, and they set up this event over here. And all of them were witnesses to the event. They didn't know that's what they were being set up for. But then after the event, they brought them into a jury box, and they started asking them questions. What did you see? How did, how did it play out? It was all over the map. Everybody saw something different. Was she wearing a red coat? No, it was brown. Was he wearing a hat? No, he, he didn't have a hat. All these things were all, but we see things sometimes differently, either okay or because of our own persuasions. Um, so, yeah, we may have it wrong. Even when you see the exact same thing. Yes, right, right. So when we're approaching a, a brother or sister who has uh, offended us, we need to be cautious about our version of the facts. And that, I believe, is why it says, okay, next step, take one or two others. Now, does that mean take my best friend who sees the world my way and to whom I've already gossiped about this and has already formed an opinion? Probably not. That's right. That's right. We need to find someone who can view a situation fair and square, who we respect to help us, but also who the other might respect as well, um, this person is not someone that we have on our side to bolster our voice. Now, <clears throat> the result may be that our voice is confirmed, but that's not the tact we should take. We should not go into it with our one or two others just because we've strengthened our army. We go into it saying, we need help clarifying we need help making sure that we're seeing each other eye to eye, trying to figure out what each other is saying, getting our facts straight, and it may be that we both need corrected. So we need one or two other people to help us in that endeavor. Now, one of the other reasons for one or two people 
goes back to the law and the culture of the Jewish people. What was that law? Some of you know? Yes. You must have, to accuse someone, you must have the eyewitness of two people. That goes back to Deuteronomy 19. If we want to chase that rabbit, Deuteronomy 19, 15. One witness is not enough to convict. One witness is not enough to convict anyone accused of any crime or offense they may have committed. A matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. Okay. So it was not only cultural, but it was also by God's law that you needed two or three people to, to see and say the same thing, to be witnesses to the event in order for that witness to stand in court. This is one of the reasons, and this is a small aside, this is one of the reasons that they tried to find two people to convict Jesus. And uh, so they ended up having some false testimonies. Okay. But you had to have two, at least two. So here Jesus is saying, hey, go get someone else. Make sure that it is a clear witness, a, a fair witness, someone who actually has fellowship on their minds and who you respect enough so that if they say now Paul you're just not I, I get it I see that there was an offense here but you're not you're not following through on this on your side you're not chasing it the right way you're not expressing yourself the right way I need to respect this person enough to where they can correct me and be okay with it and I need to be okay with it and I'm not even the offender I'm the offended one I want to get my way I want to point my finger at them. No. So you find these people. Now, what's important is that you know who these people are in your life, even right now. If someone were to offend you right now, who would you take? Who would you say, call up on the phone, hey, I'm going over, I, I don't want to share too many details right now, but I'm, I'm struggling with an issue with so-and-so. It's a serious issue, and I need someone who's fair to, to mediate, okay? One might say mediate as a word. To be there in the, in the conversation. I've already talked to him once, didn't go as well as I thought it needed to. And remember, our effort is not to criticize and judge, our effort is to restore. So, who do you have? Who would you call on? Verse 17, if that doesn't work, remember our goal, restoration to the folds of God, to, to the flock, restoration to fellowship. You know, if it's egregious, if it's really something that's a problem, and this person really does need restored, then you can go public with it. Not public to the world, public to the church, or public to the fellowship of Jesus. Okay. Why would you do that? What does that do? What does that help? And this actually could apply to the two or three as well. From the let's let's put yourself in the position of the offender. The one that's trying to be restored. What would it do for you? to have two or three or the whole church come to you and address something? What would that look like to you? Why would that be important? Okay, ganged up on? Okay, okay. Okay, yeah. Well, so we could have certain, certain feelings about it. One is we, we could build stronger walls. It's like, oh, they're coming at me with a full force now. But remember, if they've done it correctly, in love, hopefully they wouldn't feel that way. And, and hopefully that person would have already fixed things at one of the first two stages. So if you're, if you're the offender and you're at the third stage, you either have a very fair point of view or you're hard-hearted or hard-headed. OK? 
Okay, <laughs> you're hard, hard-headed. Yeah, hard-headed. Okay. And Steve, one more time. What was yours? Uh, I said ideally, it might knock down my previous position. Yes. Right. We may we may hold off the one, and we may hold off the two or three because, by golly, we think we're right. But when the whole group of people stands up and says, "Let's let's talk about this," and if in that discussion with the whole group, it's acknowledged that maybe you didn't chase the right way, maybe you didn't live the right way, make the right decisions, then it tears down some that I was right, you were wrong philosophy. Okay? Another thing that I think it might do is it enhances the urgency. Because if we can get away with whatever path we're going down, then the restoration is not urgent. Or it doesn't feel urgent. But by the time you get to the two or three witnesses, oh, all right, so apparently someone really thinks this is serious. And then the whole congregation or the whole assembly this is, a, this is important. Now, remember, put this in the context of this is a, dis, well, the, the flow of the chapter. I'll say that. Started out with what? Thinking like a child. Being the childlike disciple. Wanting to grow in humility. It, it, being humble. Wanting to grow in, in fellowship of Jesus. Being rightly guided being nurtured and understanding that there are stumbling blocks along the way that could lead us astray and Jesus himself says man I came to save I, I care about that person who wanders away so now we're in a role where the whole church is saying can we sit down and think about this if it gets to that point one should pay attention Absolutely. If the one is in sin and is left to live life in sin, then they could easily lead other, like sheep, lead other sheep astray. Uh, hey, I found green or grass over here. And so five or six people go that way. And pretty soon you see a whole bunch of people over there. And then you end up with what we call a split in the church, right? Now, I don't want to go there. <laughs> but you find that, that you have led people astray. And, and we don't want that. Jesus doesn't want that. We as Christians don't want that. So it's very important. When it gets to this point, I think if I'm the offender and I see this, it's a wake-up call. Or it should be a wake-up call. That says, ooh, something serious here. Uh, when it gets to that point. Now, what happens, though, if I still don't pay attention? Let's say I've done something egregious. And you've tried to work it out with me. -uh. So you bring a couple other people that are, that probably I've trusted. Hopefully, you bring the right people that I've trusted and that I consider are deciding fairly over the issue. And I still say, -uh. So it goes to a larger uh, assembly. And when we say assembly, that doesn't mean the the whole church has to get together. It's larger representatives of the church. But anyway, and, and again, when I say the church, they didn't see it as the church necessarily here because the church didn't exist at that time. They saw the assembly. They saw the, the assembling of disciples. And if they really needed to, they did address things. They had people in the synagogue who made decisions. And so that may have been what they were thinking when it came to that. Okay, So... That happens, and I still say, uh, then what? Is this about putting them out of the church? No, it's about resolving the differences. That's what the whole conversation is about. It's not about sending them out of the church. It's about resolving the offense. Yes, we all, have, we all make choices and we all bear the consequences of those choices. So, what, what, um, <laughs> that, was, that was different. Um, time to go home. No, almost, almost. It was, yeah, it was. So, when Jesus says, 
When Jesus says, uh, verse 17, if they still refuse, tell it to the church. If they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or tax collector. What does that mean? Ignore them. <laughs> Okay, that's okay. Um, try to um, revisit the the elements of the gospel, the the principal elements of the gospel, to to let them see that they're. Um, right, right. Uh, so yes, try to get them to see the elemental points of the gospel. See why uh, fellowship of Jesus is important. But very likely, they're at a point in their life where they aren't willing to listen. What I think the intent of Jesus' words here, where it says, if they don't listen to the church, treat them as a pagan or a tax collector, it's not saying kick them out of the church. Now, that may, that may need to happen, depending on the sin and depending on the, the uh, influences that they have within the church. But what it's saying is, now you can take them to civil court. Oh, that's a different way to look at it, isn't it? All right. So you've gone the route of one-on-one. -on -one. You've gone the route of the trust of two or three. And you've also taken it to the church. Let's try to repair this issue. Remember what the, oppression, the aggression is, the, the offense is. It's got to be some significant offense to make it this public. Okay. And if... It's not resolved at the level of the assembly. Then you can take it to the civil courts. You can treat them in the political arena. You can treat them in the outside world. Now, why do I say this? If we go to 1 Corinthians 6, I believe it's 1 Corinthians 6, if I wrote it down right. Paul really gets on to the Corinthians. And I've got it in, in a couple of verses, but verse 1, Paul says, If any of you, because they were, they were not getting along, these Corinthians were hard-headed people. And what they were doing is they were actually taking their offenses to the civil courts. Christians suing Christians in the civil courts. And Paul says, If any of you has a dispute with one another, don't, don't uh, do you dare, I can't read today, did you notice that? If any of you has a, dis a dispute with another, do you dare take it uh, before the ungodly for judgment instead of before the Lord's people? Skipping down to verse 4. Is that right? Where is it? Yes, 4. Therefore, if you have disputes, uh, disputes about such matters, do you ask for a ruling from those whose way of life is scorned in the church? I say this to shame you. Oh, wow. How about that? Is it possible that there is nobody among you wise enough to judge a dispute between the believers? In other words, come on, we have enough people in the church with enough wisdom that they can judge this fairly. Instead, one brother takes another to court, and this in front of unbelievers. Paul is exasperated. It's like, look, you didn't follow the principles of Matthew 18, he says. Wait a minute. If we look at it that way, then this whole passage isn't about discipline within the church and eventually getting to excommunication. If we look at it that way, it's about restoration. And then only after it goes through this process and where we can't resolve the difference that is egregious among ourselves, among the assembly, then... You can treat the circumstance in the public arena. Then you can take them to court. I think that's what he's saying. Okay. All right, so what does Jesus say after that? Verse 18, truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. We saw that verse before in a, a little bit different way, right? Where did we see it before? Okay, he was talking to Peter and uh, possibly James and John and, and uh, talking about, um, actually he was talking to all of the disciples because it was right after P Peter's great uh, profession. You are the Messiah, the son of the living God. 
And then he talks about how the teaching, the ministry that they were to have, would cause people's hearts to either become soft and open to the gospel or be hard and be bound, closed to the gospel. And that binding and that loosing was not, in that context, the way we looked at it anyway, it was not the apostles were making a decision that this person was bound and this person was loosed. No, if the apostles were doing what the apostles were to do, and that was to be ambassadors for Jesus, to teach and, and minister the word of God, the gospel message, people would naturally bind and loo be bound and loosed because of their own disposition, because of their own attentiveness to that message. And then whatever is bound and loosed in the hearts and, and, and minds of the people would result in that binding and loosing of the judgments that they yield in, by God in heaven. That's what we talked about before in Matthew 16. Here, it's not about the teaching that the disciples were supposed to have. It was about the context of restoration. So, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven in the context of restoring that soul. In the context of reclaiming that disciple for Jesus into the fellowship. And if by chance they're hard-hearted, hard-headed, and still just want to go their way, let them go their way, and that decision will also be um, confirmed. Their decision will be confirmed in heaven. So it's not that any group, any person on earth is saying, this is your penalty, this is your judgment, and I'm binding this on you. That's not what it's saying. It's saying due to the circumstance, if you really look at the, how, the intent of the process and the result of the process, that binding, binding together, that, that coming to fellowship again, that restoration is going to be rewarded in heaven. What is bound on earth is bound in heaven. My opinion. I think that's really what it's saying. Um, verse 19. Oh, what a verse, right? Again, truly I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, then I am with them. Oh, I love that verse. That means I can go fishing every Sunday as long as I have one other person with me. <laughs> now, isn't that how we try to use that verse? Wherever two are in, in the name of Jesus, well, Jesus is there. Remember our context. Here's a question. Who are the two? Who are the three? Offender, offended, possibly that third witness. When they have come together in the same mind, in agreement with Jesus in the midst, that agreement is confirmed. That Unity, that bond, that relationship, that fellowship in Christ is confirmed. It's sealed. I think that's what it's saying. It's reaffirming reconciliation. We've got to keep that in context. Now, we don't have time for the fun stuff. We got through to the end, but the fun stuff was to talk about forgiveness. Um, to talk about what does that look like in our own lives. To talk about is it easier to ask for forgiveness or is it easier to give forgiveness? How well do we give forgiveness? Is it sustained? But the good thing is Oh, we didn't make it to the end of the chapter. We made it to the end of that section. We get to talk about it next week. Because next week is the parable about forgiveness. 
It's called the unmerciful servant in my Bible. But it is a parable that talks about God's forgiveness for us and how well do we then turn around and forgive others. So we get to have a really neat conversation. I don't know. I think, I think we can have a really good conversation, especially given the number of counselors in this group, the number of advisors in this group. I think we can have a really healthy discussion on forgiveness. How does forgiveness play out in our lives? As either the one who needs forgiven or the one who gives forgiveness. What does that look like? So be thinking this week. You might want to read ahead. Read the end of the chapter, verse uh, 21, all the way through 35. We're going to finish that sucker next week. But uh, that's actually, it's, 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 the storyline is pretty fast. But we may want to slow down and have a really thoughtful discussion about forgiveness in general. Um, so I'm kind of excited to see what you pull out of it. Um, I know that there's a lot of experience in this room. And I would love to draw from that experience. I would love to be helped by that experience. So be thinking about forgiveness and how it's worked in your life and, and maybe uh, situations where you have guided other people through that process of forgiveness as that third member, as the one, you remember, the, the opposer and the opposed or the uh, offended and the uh, offender. Maybe it didn't work out in the first go around and now you had to bring that third party in as the third party, as the mediator, as the mentor, one might say, what does forgiveness look like from that, that overall perspective when you don't have um, that emotional tie? Because tr we can see facts in our own way because of the emotional tie that we have. So when you step outside of that emotional tie, things look a lot differently. When you're not invested in the outcome as much uh, personally, then that whole situation could look differently. So what does that look like when you are that third eye or that third party? Be thinking about that, and we'll pick that up next week. It may be that that's all we do next week. But if not, we'll, we'll start into chapter 19. All right. <laughs> yeah, you're laughing. <laughs> Let's pray, and then we'll be dismissed. Lord, thank you so much for uh, the gift of salvation, the gift that we can... We can stand here before you knowing our sins, knowing our failings, uh, but call on your name, call on your son Jesus, and know that we can be forgiven. Father, we're so thankful that uh, your son came to this earth to save, that uh, you have such concern for us that you're willing to go not just the extra mile, but the thousands of miles in order to find those that need you and to redeem those that need you and help us to remember that, that, that we ourselves are one of those. And uh, as we look around at the people around us, help us to be reminded that, that we need you just as much as they need you first. And then to remember that they need you, that we can be that shining light that exposes your son on their lives and that they can see your glory and they can see the need that they have for your son and, and a savior. Thank you, Father, for the words of, of the Bible. Thank you for uh, the wisdom that's in it. And uh, we pray that we open our hearts and minds to, to your spirit and that uh, your spirit guide us in that wisdom that is exposed. Thank you, Father, for the people here. And we pray uh, for all the prayer needs that uh, were listed. We pray for your peace, your healing, your comfort, and, Father, for your strength in each one of those situations. Be with us throughout this next week and bring us to, uh, together again. It's through your son we pray. Amen.